uh, taught in Christian schools for about 14 years up in Ohio. Uh, we've got uh, two kids and uh, five grandkids. And uh, when the, uh, the kids grew up and left home, so did mom and dad, we went off to Africa. Uh, we worked in Christian schools for missionary kids and also in villages uh, like this. And it was a natural thing after teaching kids for all these years why they can trust the Bible uh, to connect with answers in Genesis when I came back to the States with the Croatia Museum and the Ark. Uh, with their new Ark, uh, they didn't need as many speakers anymore after being with them for about eight years. Uh, so I just transferred over to Reasons for Hope. We're a lot like Answers in Genesis. Uh, we just don't have an arc, though. But anyways, uh, what's, what's uh, Reasons for Hope about? We want people to believe the Bible, all of it, without reservations, without doubts, because there are so many people that have questions. They're thinking that the Bible's a myth, and they're, they're plagued with these, these questions that become mental monsters. Maybe you've heard some of them like this. Uh, how can you Christians believe in a book written by goat herders 4,000 years ago? I mean, just get real. This is an age of science. And if there's a loving God, why is there death and suffering in the world? Anybody heard that one? Yeah. And how can you get millions of species of animals on a boat? There's got to be a fairy tale in the Bible. And besides, you Christians, you're so arrogant, you're so intolerant, you think that Jesus is the only way. Folks, there's a lot of questions, and I find that that's not just out there. I find right within the church, people are wrestling with whether they can open the Bible and trust everything that God says right from the very first chapter. You know what? They don't know we've got the real history. It's from an eyewitness. God himself who was there that told us what happened. So we got the real history from the beginning all the way to the end. And it goes like this. God didn't need billions of years to create, did he? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. He didn't need billions of years. See, he made everything in six normal days, made a perfect earth. No millions of years of death and suffering and things like that. Made a perfect earth. It was a world where we could have lived forever because Adam and Eve could have had kids. That would have been us. We could have had perfect fellowship with God forever. What happened? Well, Adam sinned. When he sinned, it changed everything. Now we live in a broken earth. Now we live in a world where there's death and suffering and all of us need a savior. Sin got so bad, God destroyed the entire world in a global flood. And then after that, people didn't obey God again. They st stayed in one place, so God confused the languages of family groups, getting people to migrate all over the earth, and then eventually the creator of the universe, as Jesus himself, became a baby. So he could grow up and be our perfect substitute. And if you've trusted in him, he took your place, rose from the dead, and if you've trusted in him, he's coming back, and he's going to restore us back to much like it was at the beginning. You looking forward to that? Oh, there's the real history. We're big on teaching that history and chronologically. That's why we have this particular timeline. It goes from Adam all the way to Joe Biden. I'm not kidding you. It's got a picture of him. And, uh, but it's got secular history, biblical history, like you know, the Trojan horse. What was going on biblically during that time? You see, because there's not two histories. There's not spiritual ideas you learn in church and real history you get in school, right? You see, literal chronological history. We like to teach it chronologically, like with this book. It's a 10 minute, you can hold kids' attention for 10 minutes and you can go through the entire Bible in a short time with a little timeline because uh, why are we big on chronologically? Because they're not stories. They're real events that happen in history. Okay, so we need to teach them like that. See, Satan doesn't want people to believe that history. It's okay to teach like stories, fairy tales, that's fine, but not real history. And he's got a strategy. How does he get people not to believe that history? He lies, just like always. He starts with little kids and says, boys and girls, you like science? And the kids say, sure. Who doesn't like science? It gives you cell phones. It gives you cures for diseases. It gives you rocket ships. And then here comes the lie, boys and girls. E evolution and and sci is science, boys and girls, and with all the evidence for evolution, why would anybody want to believe that book? Right? And Christians, they just refuse to look at all the facts of science that proves you can't believe the Bible. You think this is effective for kids? It really works, right? And then those kids grow up, and they think, well, I believe in science. I don't 
believe the Bible, and they can never get to the place where they can come to faith in Jesus Christ because of that one word. And what is that? Well, science, right? Yeah, see, nobody wants to be a science denier, right? Christians just take a blind leap of faith against all the evidence that proves the Bible's a myth. And with that kind of pressure, there's a whole lot of people right in the church that are thinking, you know, when I look at what God says at the beginning, maybe we need to overlay what man thinks happened over top of that because man knows better than what God said. Yeah, well, it's happening all the time. So before I talk about the literal history, we got to deal with this where somebody says, you know, you can't believe the Bible because science says, and then therefore people don't want to be a science denier. Well, if somebody's going to say that about science, maybe we ought to know what it is from the Science Council themselves. They say science is observation of evidence. It's experimentation. It's repeating those experiments and then getting other people to repeat your experiments as verification. Then you can come to conclusions and make laws of science. With laws of science, you can make uh, rocket ships and cures for diseases. It gives us wonderful things. Is anybody here against science? Anybody? You like science gives us great things. Again, are they used to talking? You know, it's okay, right? So you can do that. Don't feel intimidated. But here's the thing. The evolutionists set it up like this. Say, you can believe in God if you want to, but it's always against science. So convincing. So when somebody says, science says you can't believe the Bible, you know, we get upset. We say, no, the Bible says, and they say, science says, the Bible says, you're not going to get very far there, right? See, with apologetics, it's always good to have good questions. And a good question here is, you might say, oh, you're saying science says you can't believe the Bible. That's interesting. Uh, what kind of science are you talking about? Are you talking about observational science or historical science? Now, all of a sudden, they don't have no idea what you're talking about. So you may have to take some time and talk about a definition of science before you can even get a chance to open up Scripture. Because they're convinced they're on the, uh, on the high side here. You know, science has proved this is a myth. They don't want to even hear it. So let's talk about two different types of science. There is observational science, the kind you can observe. You can do experiments. You can repeat those experiments. You get other people to verify them. And uh, there, then you can make uh, uh, things like rocket ships and cures for diseases, wonderful things like that. Here's an illustration. Uh, back a while ago, there were two scientists working on the Hubble Space Telescope. One was an evolutionist, the other was a creationist. They had no trouble working with each other. You know why? They were both working with observational science. So what are they working with? They're working with like the law of gravity. They had to overcome that. Laws of thrust to put a rocket up and so on. So where did they disagree? Well, they disagreed about what they believed in the past. One scientist says, I believe we evolved over millions of years. The other scientist says, no, I believe God created. I got a question. Does that belief about the past have anything to do with putting a satellite up? Anybody? No, right? But people do have beliefs about the past, right? Do we as Christians, do we have a belief about the past? We do, don't we? Yes. Are you embarrassed about that belief? Good, I got a reaction there. I hope you're not embarrassed about that belief. Right, see, uh, but if you don't want to believe what God says, see, we've got an advantage. We've got an eyewitness that was there that told us what happened. But if you don't want to believe him, then you've got to have another belief of what you think happened over millions of years of natural processes and so on. So you've got two types of science. You've got the kind you can experiment with and you can come to conclusions. And then you've got somebody's belief about the past where they look to evidences from science that might support it, but you can't observe it, you can't test it, you can't repeat it, right? It, it's a belief about the past, all right? But you know what? The evolutionists, they don't catch this most of the time. Yeah, they say things like this. I don't understand those Christians. They take antibiotics that comes from science, but they don't want to believe how we got here that comes from science. Do you see how slick that was? They went right from one to the other. Now, I'm going to give you another illustration because this is important. If you don't learn anything else that I say all day, I want you to get this one thing. The difference between observational science and historical science and then be able to teach it to the next generation and next generation because it'll help you your entire life because there's always going to be some things come down where somebody's going to say, well, see, I got proof, scientific proof, right, that science says 
Christians who can't believe the Bible, when they say that, what do you say? What kind of science are you talking about? Say it. What kind of science are you talking about? All right, I'm going to ask you that again. So you got that? All right, here we go. Crime scene investigation is about science, right? Forensic science. Here's the evidence that they've got. They've got fingerprints on the knife. What do you think? I think that's a slam dunk. I think they got this guy cold. You know what? The trouble is, by the time you get to court, there's going to be two beliefs about the past. One attorney is going to say, he walked in the room and he saw the knife and he picked it up. That's how his fingerprints got there. The prosecutor is going to say, oh, no, no, you see the fingerprints prove that he's the murderer, right? Do, do evidences prove anything? Do they? Do they prove anything? No, they're always interpreted through a different belief, okay? So you've got evidences in the present, two different ways of looking at the same evidence, okay? So that, that's what we really have, but this is how the, the evolution has set it up. They say, well, we've got the facts, facts of science about Big Bang, millions of years of rock layers and, and, uh, and, and life evolving. But what you get in church, boys and girls, you can believe that by faith if you want to. But it's always against the facts of science. See, because we got the material stuff, you just got myth in church. We got real stuff, kids. All you have is spiritual things in church. But what we really have, we have observations that we can see we have two beliefs about the past, all right? The problem is the evolutionists are so convinced their belief is right, they call their science and they point the finger at Christians and say, you don't believe in science and we've been letting them get away with that way too long, haven't we? So why do I believe what God says and I don't believe what man says? I asked that question. One little boy right in the front row says, it's because what God said. <clears throat> Is that too easy for you? You see, we've got an eyewitness that was there. And he gave it to us in a written account of what happened. And I know him personally. Do you know him personally? Yes. Do you know he's trustworthy? Yes. yes. So if what God said actually happened and what man thinks happened never happened, if that's the case, what would you expect when you go out and just look at what we see in the present? Observations. You know what I would expect? I would expect the observations ought to go along with what God says and go against what man thinks happened because that never happened. Wouldn't you expect that? Yes. I would and it's, it's true. Science, that's observational science, really confirms what God says. That's one of the first talks I'm going to do uh, tomorrow in school of how observational science really confirms because if, if you don't start out with belief in God's word, there's not going to be any foundation for spiritual growth. Is that right? right. You've got to start there. So when somebody says, here's scientific proof that evolution is a fact, what do you say? Good. What kind of science are you talking about? Are you talking about the kind of science you can observe or somebody's belief about the past? See, what you can do if you're a Sunday school teacher or with kids, you can put this, these figures up on the wall. And it only take you maybe 30 seconds to do this in Sunday school class. But you can ask them, what did you learn in the science class this week? And when somebody says, well, we learned about mixing baking soda and vinegar together and it fizzes. You know, that's science. And you ask, is that what you can observe? and experiment with or what believed about the past. And they'll know right away, well, that's what we can observe. Next week they come in, what'd you learn in science? Well, we learned about how the moon was captured by the earth millions of years ago, billions of years ago, actually. And then what do you do? You ask them, is that what we can observe in the present or what people think happened in the past? You got it? They, you need to nail that down. Help, that'll help them the rest of their life. So now that we comprehend that difference, let's talk about what God actually said in his word. Got a question. Could God have used billions of years to create? Yeah, yeah. God can do anything. The thing is, it's not a matter of what God could have done. See, it's a matter of what he said he did. Uh, the Bible sounds so unscientific though to so many people that's embarrassing six days right you know we don't have to be embarrassed about what god says you know what they say in the beginning there was nothing which exploded 
Do we have to be embarrassed about what God says? No, we don't. But, you know, to a lot of Christians, you know, six days sounds really kind of embarrassing. So they're thinking, well, maybe we can mix the two together. Maybe the days in Genesis are like long periods of time and, and, uh, and, and that, ty- that type of thing. And so, uh, but, uh, but you see, because it, it's obvious it takes a long time for things to happen. That's the way God must have done it. Is that true? Well, how about when the Creator Himself was on this earth? You know what He was able to do? He was able to stand there and take trillions and trillions of atoms and simultaneously rearrange them to take dead, decaying, smelly body cells and turn them into living cells. And He did it with the words of His mouth. Do you believe that? Yes. Right. Could He do the same thing? Just say, let there be light. You see, he didn't need billions of years, but to a lot of Christians, I mean, they're convinced it takes long periods of time. So maybe those days in Genesis are like long periods of time. Yeah, maybe that. Well, let's take a look at that. It's actually the word day can refer to, to uh, could refer to a general time period. It can refer to a, a particular day. Like if I were to say back in my father's day, is that a particular day? No, it's a general time period. And if, but if I were to say I was born on the 29th day of April, well, everybody understands that you've got a date there and things like that. We're talking about a normal day. I don't think my mom thought it was a normal day that day. But anyways, we're talking about a regular day. Uh, that's because the, the context tells you. And the same with the Old Testament, the word yom. You know, it can refer to a general time period. It can refer to a regular day. How do you know the difference? The context will tell you. Especially if you've got a number like first, second, or third day, or, or uh, evening, sunrise, all those clues. They get, they, we're talking about regular days here. It's like when Joshua went around Jericho. What does Scripture say? The first day they went around once. Second day they went around again. Have you ever heard anybody say, I don't think those are normal days. I think maybe they're millions of years. Who knows? Joshua was probably a really, really old guy by the time he got to that second day. Yeah. I never heard anybody say that. How about... You know, Jonah had to be in that fish for like 3,000 years because a day could be like 1,000 years, you know. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Where's the only place people question the day? The word day. It's in the first chapter of the Bible. And God is very, very specific. He says, in the evening and the morning was the first day. Evening and the morning was the second day. Evening and the morning was the third day. See, he's very specific. He wanted us to know he didn't need a lot of time. He didn't do it just like that. So my question is, why did he take so long? Have you ever wondered that? I wonder weird stuff. Oh, so, right. But, uh, so why did he take so long? Well, God says, if you didn't get it right in the first book, let's go to the second book. And he says, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and the sea, and all them in there is, and then he rested on the seventh. So I guess this must be an example for us to work for six billion years and rest for one, right? I think you got what I'm talking about. Then how old is the earth? There's the kicker, all right? Because here's the evolutionary perspective. Billions of years ago, there was nothing that exploded, and all that nothing turned into something that turned into planets and stars. And then on earth, you got life evolving all by itself on earth. And finally, you get to the age of dinosaurs. They roam around for millions of years. They die off. Finally, at the end, finally, you get people, right? Isn't that what they would say? We got about right. But let's see what God said. I mean, uh, Jesus himself was there, right? He ought to know. And what did he say? Well, Jesus said, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So there's Adam and Eve right there at the beginning, not billions of years later after he started everything with a big bang. Is this making sense? Right? So how old is the earth? Well, if Adam and Eve were there at the beginning, if we could figure out how long ago God made Adam, would that give us an idea how old the earth is? Anybody with me on that? All right, so let's figure this out. We're going to have to go back to Adam's family and trace that all the way back. (laughs) All right, not that one. But yeah, we do have genealogies in Scripture. It traces all the way back to that first man named Adam. In the New Testament, it goes from Mary and Joseph in an unbroken line all the way back 
to that first man named Adam. And there's a reason for that in the New Testament. I'll get to that in a little bit. But in the Old Testament, you even have years. Adam lived 130 years and begat Seth and then so on. And you can use those d dates to figure these things out. From Adam to Abraham, it was about 2,000 years. And from Abraham to Jesus, it was about 2,000 years. And from Jesus to present, about 2,000. You know, it's getting more every year. But uh, So about how long ago did God make Adam? You don't have to be a mathematical genius on that, right? Now, I would expect the atheist not to believe that. I can understand where they're coming from, you see? They believe everything happened by natural processes, right? And so if that's the case, it's got to take a long time because it takes a long time for nothing to turn to everything. Now, you can tell a kid that a frog turned into a prince and they will know right away that that's a fairy tale. But if in school, you can tell them the exact same thing happened. But only this time, boys and girls, it happened over millions of years. Now, that's science. Yeah? You can't argue with science, can you? You see, this is why long periods of time is so crucial. You see it everywhere. You see it on the History Channel and museums and in national parks, everything. Millions of years ago, boys and girls, this happened. It's crucial. Why? If they don't have long periods of time, then everybody thinks it's a fairy tale. Nobody, they don't want people to think it's a fairy tale, they want people to think it's science. So the, long, the more time you give, the more scientific it sounds, okay? So, like I'm saying, I can understand the atheist not wanting to believe what God's Word says. That's fine if they don't. You, you know what, well, I have a problem with a whole lot of Bible teachers that would say, I don't know much about science, but, you know, whatever the scientist says, we'll go along with that. I got a problem with that, see, because what's happening the atheists and the Bible teachers, they're actually joining forces and they're telling the world one thing, and believe me, the world has already picked this up. They're saying, you can't believe what God actually said in his word. Now, I'm going to give you an illustration of this. He's a, uh, a man you may recognize. His name's Andy Stanley, and I've listened to him. He's a good preacher. He's got a big church up in Atlanta and satellite churches around. Uh, but what he's going to do, he's going to try to reconcile the science religion thing with it with his people and people all over the country listen to what he has to say your Sunday school job probably could not be reconciled with science I understand that your Sunday school God the God that your church left you with as a child in a middle school or high school and never went beyond that that God probably could not be reconciled with science that is something that you have to understand and so what's he saying there he's saying what you learn about God in Sunday school is probably not reconciled so what's he saying there he's saying what you learn about God in Sunday school really it doesn't fit very well with science so, so listen to what he has to say, why, is that, why he believes that. If we only really believe that God is the creator of the universe, that all time, space, and matter, all time, space, and matter were created by God, and we take seriously what science has told us, that it all began with a singularity, that's what it's referred to. Oh, how did God do it? Well, you've got to go along with what science has told us. It's called a singularity. Anybody know what that is? That's when there was nothing, and that nothing exploded and became everything. All right? So... That's what they say, but what does God say? Well, God made the earth first, right? In the beginning, he made the heaven, space, and then he put the earth in it, right? When did he make the stars? It wasn't until day four, okay? You see? So, you know, there really wasn't a Big Bang, but, and you realize there's a whole lot of evolutionary scientists that don't believe the Big Bang. They got a lot of problems with it. There's a lot of problems. Just look at observational science. It just doesn't fit, right? So they're even putting it in, in, uh, in Scientific American magazine. Why the best explanation how the universe evolved must be fixed or replaced because it doesn't work. We've got to work on this Big Bang idea. So, and even the, the James Webb Telescope, it's throwing a big monkey wrench into some of their beliefs, all right? But... Andy Stanley thinks, well, this is science. That's what they say. So how do you reconcile this? Listen to what he has to say. And then I want you to prescribe something or explain to me what we are going to do in the real, tangible, material world to fix and heal my child. Because when it comes to illness and when it comes to sickness, we, come on, we are all about science. And the moment your theology conflicts, conflicts with the discoveries of science, you have a theological problem, not a science problem. Hmm. 
What did he just say? He says, uh, aren't you glad that scientists do experiments to figure out what's the best antibiotics to give to kids if they have an ear infection? Are you glad? What kind of science is that? Observational, right? But then he says, right, you got to go along with what scientists say. Now, I'd like to include here, you know, I've listened to him speak. I believe he loves the Lord. I believe I'm going to be with Andy Stanley forever in heaven. But I want you to see what this type of idea does to the authority of Scripture. And this is what's happening to our country and the world. Listen to how he reconciles this. What would you ask Andy Stanley right then? What kind of science are you talking about? Right? Somebody's belief about the past or what we can actually observe in the present. Okay. Here's what's going on. There are so many people that are taking what man thinks happened in the past. That becomes the authority. And then you have to stick that into the Bible like God didn't know what he was talking about. We know better. We're, you know, that was just written for primitive people. And we're, we know better now. And so we've got to change what God says. You know, if there's an outside authority that supersedes what God says, you know what, I guess what other people think. Anything that people out there think. That can also become an authority. Have you noticed an awful lot of churches going along with the woke agenda and all these different things? Like it's the Bible? Anybody notice that? Yes. Yeah, okay. What do we have to do? Well, we better start with what God says as the authority. You with me there? Yes. We use what God says, all right? And then that helps us understand what happened out there. You see all these rock layers. Millions of years. Well, no, God says there was a flood. Yeah, we use what God says to help us understand what happened. And then we use what God says to help us navigate through all these problems out there. The, see, the problem is, is that people don't realize that God created us. He makes the rules. He designed us to function in a certain way. We don't make the rules. Right? So this is what we, we need to start with. The word of God is the authority. Don't be embarrassed about it. How do you not be embarrassed and be confident? Well, that's why we brought some books, all right? Uh, these books from Answers in Genesis are a great place to start if you want to know how to answer all these questions that are in the back of your mind. Each book gives 25 or 30 of the most asked questions. The ones that have convinced people down through history, you can't believe the Bible. Uh, by the way, we take cash, check, or credit card. We just like to get something in your hands. But these are a great start. For young people, these are devotional guides. Uh, they're, they're more of uh, the social issues and, the, and the struggling with life. Uh, for example, the red book, the last one, it says, why would God love somebody so messed up like me? Does that sound like a young person? See, that you got to deal with those things. And we've got quick answers to tough questions. This one goes through the entire history of God's Word, answers some questions like radiometric dating and things like that. It's a thin one because it's not an overkill. And then if you believe what God's Word says, well, where will it take you on the social issues? How do you deal with those? And we've got apologetic books for little children. Right? In other words, these will help little kids deal with questions they probably already have, but they're afraid to ask. You know, questions that, you know, the little kids have these questions and nobody deals with them, and then they grow up and think there's no answers, and then you wonder why they, by the time they go off to college, they're not coming back to church, right? You know, so, yeah, we, and we've got this book here, uh, Crafted by God. It helps kids understand there's only two genders. There's only one race. How do we get here? And books on dinosaurs. Uh, we got books on the culture. Two by David Jeremiah and a couple by Erwin Lutzer. You got to read. You got to understand what's going on to be able to navigate through it and help other people do that. Well, let's move along. Uh, what was the earth like when God created? Now, according to them, there was a big bang and nothing exploded, right? And every, everything, the earth was eventually molten and then it cooled off. And then you go from goo to you, right? Is that, that's their idea. Uh, I'm not kidding. Yeah, I thought that happened, but uh, okay. Uh, what was the uh, earth like, though, when God created according to what God says? Well, God says he made a perfect earth. It was an earth design where Adam and Eve could have lived there forever. 
with perfect fellowship with God, and then they could have had kids. Well, that would have been us. We could have been in that perfect earth forever. But i got a question. In that perfect earth where God says everything is very good, was there pain and suffering and death, babies born with deformities, cancer, animals ripping each other apart, thorns to step on? Is that what you think of God's idea of very good? Anybody? Some of you seem confident, some of you don't. Okay. Did Adam have to worry about this? Did he? How do you know? Well, because God told us. Right there in the first chapter, he said that every beast, every fowl, those are birds, kids, everything that creeps on the earth, girls, they had creeps back then. Can you realize that? I don't know if you realize that. Anyways, but all the animals ate green herbs. Everything was vegetarian. These were the first vegans. You see, this was a time when it was a perfect earth. God sustained it to be like that forever. But there's a lot of people. Well, you've got to go with what science says. The fossil evidence speak for itself. Does evidence speak for itself? No. But they say, no, it's obvious death and suffering's been around for millions of years. Right? So there couldn't have been a perfect earth at the beginning. And some of those Christians, they may want to say, you know, but we know that when Jesus comes back, uh, then there's going to be a time when the wolf and the lamb will lay down together. The wolf won't eat the lamb and the lion will eat grass like an ox. You looking forward to a time like that? Yeah, yeah scripture says when that happens, we're going to be restored back to much like it was at the beginning. You know what? If there was no perfect earth at the beginning where all the animals didn't, were vegetarian, is there anything to be restored back to? Is this history in the beginning important? I hope you're catching on, really. So how do we get to the place where we have to deal with this? Well, this is when Adam sinned. Adam sinned, he wanted to go his own way. As a result, God cursed the earth and then it kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden and Adam's got to work hard to get food and some of the animals became carnivorous and worst of all, all of us born in the race of Adam, we all have a broken fellowship with God. We're all separated from God just being born into Adam's race. This is what scripture says in the Old Testament, that it's Adam's sin that brought about death and separation from God. The New Testament in Romans says the same thing. But there's a lot of Christians that are thinking, well, science says death has been around for millions of years. Got a question. If death has been around for millions of years and death is not the consequences of sin, and why did Jesus have to die physically? If evolution is true, Jesus didn't have to go to the cross to pay the punishment for sin because, well, death has always been. It's not the punishment for sin. Well, if millions of years is true, then how could you answer this question? If there's a loving God, why is there death and suffering? You know what? If you believe in millions of years of death and suffering, what's the only thing you could say? You could say, well, just get over it. This is what kind of God we have. He is millions of years of death and suffering and babies born with mutations, so just get over it. Maybe we ought to tell people what God actually said. God said he made a perfect earth. It was a place where we could have lived forever with perfect fellowship with our Creator. But what happened? We sinned. It's our fault. Because of our sin, there's intrusions like death and disease and pain and suffering. Isn't that why Jesus came? To suffer and die, to take our punishment? Are you with me? That's why he came. And then Jesus is coming back. And if you've trusted in him, you're going to be in a place where God will restore us back to much like it was at the beginning. So when somebody says, if there's a loving God, why is there death and suffering? What do you say? You know what I would recommend? You say, I'm glad you asked. Don't you have an opportunity to share the entire gospel message? Right from the very beginning all the way to the end. Well, let's deal with the flood. Because a lot of people think, well, this has got to be a fairy tale. And a lot of Bible teachers think it was. Or, or they think it was just a local flood. Now, it couldn't have been a global flood because that would be evidence all over the world, right? <laughs> got to be a, a local flood. Well, Folks, the Bible says all the high hills were covered. What would a local flood look like covered, that covered all the high hills? That's not a photograph. 
Okay, you got that. All right, how about this? God promised he'd never flood the world again and put a promise in the sky that if there was a local flood, guess what? He pro broke his promises many times. And why would God have Noah build that humongous boat and put all kind of animals and birds on it? If there was a local flood, just tell Noah to move. So here's the problem. Most people think that this is a fairy tale. There's no way that a fairy tale boat like that could survive a global flood. That's why we have got to help people understand. This is what God said the ark was like. It was designed like a modern day barge. It was designed to survive a global flood. But then people think, no, how do you get millions of species on a boat like that? Obviously a fairy tale. What do you say? You're exactly right. You can't get millions of species on any size boat. But did God put them on two by two by species? Anybody know? What did he say? He created them according to kind and put them on the ark according to kind. So if we could figure out what a biblical kind was, that might help us understand how many animals were on the ark. Because we don't use that taxonomy anymore. Uh, but it is very intuitive what kinds are. Because even evolutionists will tell us all of our dogs go back to a dog type. Lots of varieties. They can all breed with each other and make fertile offspring. But all these different species and so on, but they, they're dog kind. How about uh, cats? All right, we got big ones and little ones, but they're still what? Yeah, go figure, right? Are you getting the idea what kinds are? So God put two from the dog kind with a lot of genetic diversity within those two. They get off, have lots of varieties. They go all over the world, right? Two from the cat kind, two from the horse kind. It didn't have to have zebras and donkeys and mules and all these types of things. Had two from the horse kind. So how many kinds are on that ark? Well, according to the research for the ark, they figured there was probably no more, most likely less, but no more than 1,500 kinds. That would include even animals that gone extinct. So how many animals on the ark? Quick math. 3,000. But remember, scripture says seven of the clean, seven of the birds. There was a whole lot of birds. So at the very max on that boat would be 7,000 animals, most likely a lot less. But was that boat big enough? These are people down here. You see that? Was that boat big enough? Yeah. yeah. In other words, God says this is a literal event that happened in the past. He did judge the world because of sin. And there's another judgment coming. You better get ready. That's what that ark's all about. Well, did the boat include dinosaurs? I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a time before the flood where reptile creatures did live a long time. Well, we know in, here in Florida, the longer reptiles live, the, 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 older, the bigger they get, right? Okay, so they lived a long time before the flood, so God would not have put great, 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 great grandma and grandpa on the ark, just young adults. And they've got to start quite small anyways because the eggs are no bigger than this. It doesn't make any difference how big they are. So the, the question we have to ask is, uh, if people saw them, right, then I would think there'd be evidence that people saw them. And there is. It's all over the world. You've got pictures that are drawn all over the world, clay figures found in Mexico from 2,000 years ago, other pictures all over. Uh, on this uh, 12th century temple, there's a relief that has a, a deer creature up here and a monkey down here. But what's he pointing at? Anybody want to tell me what that looks like? Yeah. Nothing that exists today, but he's got steggy things on his back, right? Yeah. In other words, yeah, they did get on the ark. They did get off the ark. People saw them. Right? Now, one of the other evidences is that they found soft tissues in dinosaur, actually T-Rex bones, and they're finding it over and over again. You know what you're looking at? You are looking at T-Rex flesh. So sure, they died off 65 million years ago. So the big question is, what happened to the dinosaurs? Everybody wonders. That's a big mystery, right? You're probably wondering this all your life, waiting for somebody to tell you, I know what happened to the dinosaurs. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They died in a they died in a, in a asteroid, right? No. They turned to birds, right? They don't have a clue, but I know what happened to them. They died. Do animals go extinct all the time? They do. Yes. 
You see, we don't have to, to make dinosaurs a big mystery if you start with what God's Word says. Even things like dinosaurs don't have to trip you up or become a mystery. That They can all be uh, put into what God says, and this is why we have the books about dinosaurs. There's so many kids think, well, if you believe in dinosaurs, you can't believe the Bible, right? And so we got books on dragons and things like that. Well, another question is, where did the water come from in this big flood? Was it just rain? Anybody? No, the Bible says specifically the fountains of the deep broke up and the windows of heaven, okay? Is there any evidence that the earth is broken up? Yeah, it's cracked all over. It's, this may be what it looked like. All right, what's going on outside the ark now? So if there really was cracking the earth, gushing up, tsunamis washing back and forth, maybe that helps us understand a little bit about plate tectonics. Right? Helps us understand how we got all these rock layers laid down quickly and then uh, as the waters rush off you get canyons. See the evolutionists look at the same piece of evidence and they say, wow, look at the little water down there can do over a long period of time. You know what we would say? Wow, look at a whole lot of water can do in a very short time. See, two different ways of looking at the same piece of evidence. You see, we don't have to be embarrassed about that, that evidence. This is why we have this book, this uh, video back there. It's an hour and a half long. It's uh, filled with great stuff on why you can trust the book of Genesis. It goes like this at the beginning. Everywhere we look, she showed me evidence of the incredible power of moving water. It quickly laid down these enormous layers and quickly eroded them away. Mm -hmm. Steve wanted to show me where the floodwaters first hit the continent. Okay. Yeah, so you know, different ways of looking at the same evidence. We don't have to be embarrassed about what we see out there. What we see really goes along with what Scripture says. Are you excited about that? I hope so, right. Well, I'd love to talk about the Ice Age or maybe radiometric dating or something. I don't have time, you know? But I do want to make sure I talk about the Tower of Babel because this is important. This is the greatest human migration in all of world history. People didn't obey God, so God came and confused the languages of family groups, causing family groups to spread out all over the world. And do we know where the family groups went? We actually do. This is fun stuff, because in Scripture we've got a, a genealogy for, of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and it tells their head sons all the way through. In other words, these would be the family heads of different groups under Ham, Shem, and Japheth. So let's take a look. Ham's family, most of them, went into Africa. How do we know that? Well, take a look right here. The country of Ethiopia to this day is sometimes called by the ancient name the land of Cush. Who's Cush? Anybody know? One of Ham's sons. Right? And here's another one of Ham's sons, right? Right out of Scripture. Isn't it fun being a Christian? You realize that? Just look at Scripture. We can tell where the different family groups went. Right? Ham's group, group there. And you know what? Genetically, we believe that Ham's family trait was probably a darker complexion. Why is that? Well, if you have a, a family group that is a little bit darker and they only marry amongst themselves because they're an isolated population, what would you expect to see today? A whole lot of people with a darker complexion. Where, how about the lighter skinned folks? Well, Japheth was most likely lighter skinned, and where they end up? Follow the names way up in northern Europe. How about Shem? Well, Shem was most middle brown. How do we know that? Well, who comes from Shem? You ever heard the word Semitic? That's where that comes from. So out of Shem comes Abraham. Uh, the uh, Arabic people, uh, middle brown people, stayed around the Tower of Babel there. Uh, and you have a lot of people 
crossing the Bering Strait during the uh, Ice Age, and you have a lot of middle brown people going all the way down through North America into South America. So like I was saying, this is the greatest human migration. This is how God split us all up. We have known for a long time because scripture says there's only one race. There is only one blood of people. But if you believe in evolution, they're convinced. Look at all the different races of people. Obviously, there's different levels of evolution. Darwin thought some people were missing links somewhere in between, you know, real homo sapiens and, and the chimpanzees, right? Uh, today, it's kind of taught subliminally, but you tell me, who's the most evolved? The darker-skinned people or the lighter-skinned people? It's everywhere you look. This ought to be embarrassing to us. Churches ought to be outraged that we're, taught, we're teaching children that the lighter skin you are, the more evolved that you are. Because we know better than that. See? Because scripture told us there's only one race, so there's no such thing as black people and white people. Did you know that? Right? There's only one color of people. There's no green people. There's no purple people. There's no orange, maybe one. But uh, uh, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no different color people. We're all the same color. What color is that, right? Well, it's the color of melanin. That's the pigment that all of us have in our skin. And what color is that? Well, that's brown. And so some people genetically have a lot of melon. Some people have a middle melon. Some people don't have much. Nobody's black and nobody's white. They're trying to divide us up like that. So we don't like to sing red and yellow, black and white. They're precious in a sight. How about shades of brown from dark to light? They're precious in a sight. I go back to churches where I've been years later and they're still teaching that to their kids. Why? We better be teaching it to our kids. It's got to be taught in the home. We're, we're being baited to divide people up. We're all the same race. My, my favorite, though, is shades of brown from light to dark. Everyone was in the ark. No. Anyway. Anyways, some people think Adam and Eve were Caucasian. I have no idea. Maybe because a light-skinned person wrote the book. I know. We think they were probably middle brown. See, most people in the world are some shade of, of middle brown. All right? So if Adam and Eve had the genetics for dark skin, middle brown skin, and light skin. You know what? In one generation, they could get the whole gamut of kids. Would they have called them races? No, they called them the kids. Can this happen today? It, it can. You see, most people that are middle brown have a limited gene pool. So when they have kids, they have middle brown kids. There are few people in the world that have a broader gene pool, much like Adam and Eve would have had. Like this couple. They had twins, and one was real dark, and one was real light. See, that messes up the, this idea about races, doesn't it? And then the Human Genome Project, the evolutions were really excited about this because now they're going to prove to those ignorant Christians that there's different races of people. This will prove it once and for all. The Human Genome Project, they got done, and they concluded there's no only one race. Don't you love it when the scientists eventually catch up with the Bible? I love it. That's why we have this book called One Blood for Kids to help young people teach them that there's only one blood. And why the church needs to address this because why the church needs to be the place of unification. We're all one in Christ when you come to Christ. And that don't get caught up in this division stuff. Well, folks, time is gone. I could go on for millions of years if you'd like, but... Uh, <laughs> Now, let me wrap it up and then we'll be done here. I got to talk about why this history is important. Here's what's happening all over our country is that young people are looking at the Bible with a certain perspective. They're thinking, oh, so what about evolution? What about age dating methods, eight men, and all these things? And with those questions, what does that do to their view of the Bible? It's just blowing it full of holes. Now, how has a lot of the church responded? Actually, most of the church today. Most of the church is saying, don't worry about that. We celebrate evolution anyways. So don't worry about all that evidence that proves you can't believe the first part of the Bible. That's okay. We don't believe the first part either. We just want you to believe in Jesus. How's that working for us? And not, not so good, right? Well, before we get too excited, we at our church, we believe the whole Bible, right? 
here's what the rest of the church is basically saying. They're saying, boys and girls, if your faith is big enough, the facts don't count. Are, are you chewing up? That's, a, that's literal. Literal, yeah. And basically what they're saying, we don't talk about dinosaurs and rock glares and all that stuff in church. Don't worry about all that stuff. We don't deal with that thing in, in, in church. We just want you to believe in Jesus. So we just take a blind leap of faith against all the evidence that proves, how's that working? Not so good. And besides, if we just take a blind leap of faith in our spiritual ideas, how can our spiritual idea be the only one that's right? Everybody else's spiritual idea is wrong. Don't you think they got a point? Do they have a point? I think they do. So how can Jesus be the only way? Because it's not just our spiritual idea. It all goes back to literal events in history. Amen? Literal events that took place. So let's deal with it. Why do we believe in a perfect earth at the end? Because there was a literal time in the beginning when there was a perfect earth and no death and suffering. All right? Is that history important? Okay. Anybody asleep out here? If you are, wake up because this is important. Okay? Why do we believe Jesus is the only way? Because it goes back to one man named Adam as a real person, not just a metaphor, not just a fairy tale, right? The genealogy in the New Testament goes all the way from Mary and Joseph all the way back to that mythical person named Adam, right? No, a real person with real genetics. That sin passed his sin nature on to every single other person. So what's God to do to save us? Can he just say, oh, okay, that's all right, I'll overlook it. Can God do that? No. What? Oh, what's the only thing he can do? Well, he's got to provide a substitute, somebody to take our punishment, right? Okay. That substitute would have to be part of the race of Adam, or he couldn't be a substitute for the race of Adam, right? Is there a problem with that? There's a big problem, because everybody in the race of Adam, born in Adam's race to Adam, to, they're all sinners. They all have to suffer and die for their own sin. So what's God to do? You see, that's why God himself, who's a perfect creator, Jesus Christ, came down and took on human flesh, born of the seed of the woman, right? So you have perfect God in human flesh, in the race of Adam, right? He suffered and died. He took our place. Is there any other way? You believe that? Yes. Right. If you believe it, you ought to be telling everybody about it. If you don't believe it, I can understand why you just keep it to yourself. Right? You trust that it's... You know, there's no other way. And there was a real global flood in the past. A judgment of God. God judged sin. And there was only one way to be saved back then. It was through into the door of the ark. Today, we know there's another judgment coming because of sin. And we know that Jesus is the door of the ark. And we stand there and say, come to Jesus, turn from your sin, turn to Jesus Christ, enter into safety into the ark. Because, yeah, there's another judgment coming. Right now the door's open. Right now you can be saved through Jesus Christ. So someday the door's going to be shut. And then it'll be too late, won't it? Pastor, if you come. Thank you, Bob. As a way of following up, uh, as our men come forward, we're going to take up a love offering for Bob. This is how he makes his living, by sharing this good news with people. And the good news cul culminates in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which you have just heard. Bob explain, and uh, so before you guys take up the offering, let me just hold up for just a second. I'm going to have a minute of prayer, and so I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes, 
And I want to give you an opportunity, if you happen to be visiting with us today, or maybe, maybe you've been attending Grace for some time, but you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. He is the only way. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man comes to the Father but by me. There's only one way. It's through Christ. He was our sin bearer. He died on the cross for your sins. He paid for those sins. He was buried and then he resurrected, proving he was who he claimed to be and that he had accomplished what he came to do. And so right now, the only thing you can do for salvation is to put your faith and trust in him. If you've never done that before, I'd like to encourage you to do that now. Just in the quietness of your mind, God is all-knowing. He knows your desires. He knows what you want. Just call out to him and let him know that you're putting your faith and trust in Christ. Maybe with a simple prayer like this. Father in heaven, thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world to die for my sins. Thank you that he rose from the dead and that right now he is offering to me salvation if I would but trust him. And so Lord Jesus, I put all my my faith and all my trust in you and what you did for me. Not in my good works. Not in trying to be a good person or my going to church. But in what you did on the cross of Calvary. Lord, forgive me of my sins and be my Savior. I'm trusting in you. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer, I would like to pray for you throughout the week. And so I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand for just a second until I see it and then put it back down. If this morning you're saying, Pastor Dean, I put my faith and trust in Jesus this morning. Is there anyone at all? Anybody at all? Okay. Thank you. You can put it down. Anyone else? Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for Bob and his ministry. We live in a day and age where only one side of the story is being told through our educational system, where it's treated as if it's fact and everything else is fiction. And yet even as we've heard, and for those of us who have researched more uh, on our own, we, we understand that true science, true science goes along with the Word of God. And there's only those extrapolations of scientists that claim that we evolve from simpler life forms. But Father, I pray that you would help us to understand these issues and to understand them well. And to be able to communicate it to our children, to our young people, uh, to our nieces and nephews, our grandchildren, our parents, our aunts and uncles, the people around us and the people that we share Christ with. Help us to be better equipped. We thank you for Bob doing so this morning. And I, I pray that we would avail ourselves of his literature, of the literature that's out there, uh, of other sources of literature, Lord. And again, that you would help us to be good, good apologists for the Christian faith, uh, good defenders of the truth of God's word. We thank you again for his ministry. We pray that we could be a blessing to him this morning as you have blessed us through his word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.